Uh, good evening. I'm seeing an extremely tired crowd by this time. Hopefully, uh, the discussion that we have uh, just now uh, should be quite enlightening, and uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping that you should be able to take something away uh, from this discussion. But the idea of this session really is to see what, are, what, are, what is it that the cities are doing to, to mitigate some of the root causes that they have um, uh, for, the, for the kind of um, how climate change is going to affect them, what, is, what are the root causes and how they're going to mitigate those in terms of uh, protecting those cities from, uh, from the effects of the climate change. So we have uh, two cities uh, being represented here. Uh, one is, of course, the city of Cochin, which is, of course, a uh, coastal city. Uh, and the other one is the city of Panjim. Uh, and we have representatives uh, from, um, from Cochin. Uh, I'll just, is it Srikant Lavande is from, from Panjim. Sorry, OK. <laughs> and um, Shankar Deshpande is from, Shankar Deshpande is from, uh, yeah, sorry, he's from uh, MMRD, he's not able to make it. And you're Kulkarni, right? You said you're both together from, uh, from Cochin. And we have uh, Mr. Rajiv Ralan. Uh, he's uh, going to talk about coaching. So um, I'm not going to spend too much of time on the introductions. I'm going to straight away going to ask you to go and make your uh, initial comments. What is it that you're doing specifically to mitigate the root causes that bother your cities, right? Cochin and Panjab. So, so you start first? So Cochin can start first and Panjab can start. We, we have a presentation as well. Okay. So, would you have your presentation? You want to take it up? Okay. Can we have the presentation up on the on the screen? Which one? Cochin first. Uh, the Cochin presentation first. Is this Cochin? Yeah. Over to you, Rajiv. Thank you. And Rajiv, you have uh, five minutes of quick presentation. Yeah and just highlight the important points Thank you. that you'd Thank like you. everybody to take home. Yeah. So this, which one is the forward one? Thank you. So good evening. Uh, I'm Rajiv Ralhan, Executive Director with PricewaterhouseCoopers India. Uh, so I am uh, invited here. So first of all, let me thank Mumbai first, European delegation for inviting me here. Uh, so I'm here to talk about uh, one of the important projects uh, under the EU-India collaboration which we call it as a clean energy climate partnership. Uh, so we, with the European delegation, we are working with government of India on many of the issues. And one of the issues is related to a net zero transformation uh, of cities. So that's where I'm here to talk, uh, briefly talk about maybe what we are intending to do. So I'll finish my presentation in five minutes and of course I'll remain available for any comments. So just 30 seconds on this slide. So what is uh, EUCCP project? Uh, so it's, it's a clean energy climate partnership. So there are two components here. Uh, one component here is strengthening the policy framework in India in areas of clean energy, uh, in areas of environment, and maybe many power related areas as well. And the other part of this project is looking at business to business collaborations, uh, looking at enhancing the research and innovation side of it. So what are the areas we are targeting under this? So if you see the focus areas here, many of the energy efficiency issues are being targeted with government of India here. And one of the uh, important issues which I'm going to discuss today is the net zero transformation then you see the, uh, the solar PV integration, all the important aspects of renewable energy, which is solar, wind, or whatever we may say. Then uh, we are also working with government of India on smart grids. Uh, we are working on sustainable coal chains as well. 
And one important part which we are trying to address through this project is how do we address this whole issue of sustainable finance to promote this green energy transition. So, so these are the key drivers of this whole EU-India collaboration, as I already discussed with you, policy exchange, uh, B2B, business-to-business -business exchange, improved sustainable financing, uh, improved research and innovation. So there are many pillars to this collaboration, and we are, we are trying to address all of these, uh, working with all the key governments, key ministries here. So what is my topic here? Uh, so I, honestly, uh, this whole uh, topic of, or maybe whole terminology of net zero is very ambiguous. So what we are maybe just trying to do here is that uh, we, we are looking at uh, promoting uh, that how can we promote this whole idea of uh, better uh, use of resources. I'll say the conservation side of it. Uh, can we be more efficient? We talk about the technology up upgradation. Uh, can we look at alternate ways to consume energy or better maybe fuels? And then we are talking about offsetting. So this is the complete definition of net zero transition which we are trying to achieve through this project. So the focus here is, as, as you understand, uh, there, when we talk about net zero transition, uh, there are many components of uh, the energy trans or overall transition, which includes uh, net zero in terms of energy, net zero in terms of water, waste, and there are many other aspects as well. What we are trying to do through this exercise is that we, we are capturing the energy side of it. And when we are working on the energy, we, we are looking at facilities, uh, we, are, we are looking at uh, what are the other public amenities where this energy is consumed at a city level or at a location level. And then we are also looking at that can we explore better way of maybe transport systems as well. So in a holistic view, maybe we are looking at our buildings, our amenities as well as our transport systems. And we are just trying to find out that what is the best strategy for net zero. So this is what we intend to achieve, CCP phase one. Uh, it would be finishing next month and maybe we'll be soon be starting phase two. But uh, we are working on five locations in India, five tourist locations So the government. In 2021, there was a plan of G20 meet in India. So this whole exercise was started. That can we come out with kind of a net zero tourist sites here. But now in next year, maybe we may have a, a G20 meet here. So we, we are working on these five sites. So that's one part is the feasibility assessment a program here, then we'll be coming out with a strategy paper that across India, how this can be taken forward. So these are the five sites which we are working. So I'm here to talk about Fort Kochi, but these are the other four sites, Gokarna Temple, Mahabaleshwar, Shri Sai Baba Sansthan Temple, Shirdi, then we are working in Leh, and then Tripati uh, in Andhra. So five locations. We are working and maybe we are identifying that how maybe we can move forward in achieving net zero transition uh, at these places. So one, when we looked at these sites, one important criteria was that how do we define the boundary? That what boundary we are talking about where maybe we, we are saying that maybe we are going to convert it to net zero. So in discussion with many local authorities, what we have seen here is that maybe a boundary of say a two kilometer area, whatever facilities are maybe lying in that vicinity, or maybe the buildings, uh, maybe whatever kind of systems are there, we are going to explore them and then we can identify approaches to make them net zero. So if I to talk about Fort Kochi, uh, we, we looked at some of the data as well, that how many hotels, how many restaurants, uh, how many retail stores, how many hospitals, so that's one kind of segregation we are looking at. The other kind of segregation which we are looking at is a residential versus non-residential use. So the electricity companies are closely engaged with us. And the third kind of segregation which we are looking at is that what is the potential of solar and all that. So all this is being captured to do this kind of analysis. Land use categorization. So if you see this, so whatever boundaries uh, we have taken, most of the area is the non-residential area, 
and, and we also looked at uh, the kind of uh, energy consumption profile, which is mostly in commercial, then residential, and then maybe the street lights and amenities. So that's the second set of segregation maybe which we are exploring. Third important point is the building typology. What kind of facilities do we have? So what we have seen in Kochi is that many old buildings, so uh, we, we, we looked at it that maybe the design of those kind of facilities and we also looked at that what are the comfort conditions because that's again very critical part when we are looking at tourism sites and then we are developing the net zero strategies here. Fourth part which is very critical is that what is the mobility pattern? So in Fort Kochi, when tourists are coming, uh, maybe they are coming by ferries, and in the local transport, what we have seen is the two-wheelers and maybe the local auto systems are there. So that's very one important part of it, that when we are talking about a net zero transition, how can we achieve this? So, so what is the approach we are taking? Uh, we, we, we are closely working with the distribution companies, the energy agencies, and the local authorities. Uh, we, we looked at all the baseline data. Now we are in the process of exploring that what kind of strategies we can propose at a city level or a tourist location level, uh, which, is, which is more of a holistic nature, and maybe which is somehow pointing towards next level of innovation. So I'll not go deep into this, but it, it's more about comparison, as I already talked about, maybe for all the interventions, uh, the, the baseline versus the kind of a future scenario modeling. Uh, so th these are the kind of interventions we, we are talking about, and then we'll be coming out with a strategy paper. So I'm left with one or two slides, and then I'll close it. So I, maybe I discussed about this. Maybe this is how we are going to generate the overall maybe strategy paper, that how can we take it forward. So I'll not go deep into this. Maybe I can talk about that later. So these are different strategies that maybe how we are going to achieve net zero at these two rich sites. Uh, I, I already talked about this from envelope to the operation side of it. And this is the overall plan that maybe uh, the measure, the reduce, maybe how do we integrate renewable energy and how do we offset it. That's the complete plan uh, we are going to do it. So last slide. So what is the way forward for us? Uh, we, we are in the last stages of coming up with overall analysis and we are in the last stage of coming out with an overall strategy paper. One is the individual reports for these five locations, but then a complete strategy paper for the country that what different tourist locations, what strategies can, they can take it forward. The next phase which we are considering here is that we might, the project might support implementation of these strategies in one or two locations. So that's what we are going to do, and then maybe we'll be organizing many uh, knowledge disseminates even events as well. So this is from my side, and I'm happy to address any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Laura. You can just uh, be here for a minute. Yeah. So basically, what you're asking uh, uh, the, the citizens of Kochi, yeah. uh, an alternative wherein they produce their own energy and see that they consume only as much as they produce, is that what it is? Yeah. Because otherwise the power is coming, if it's coming from the grid, then really it doesn't really matter whether you save or not, right? No, so the intent here is, that's what I told, that when we talk about net zero, uh, maybe sometimes we start talking about replacing one with another. What we are saying here is that, which we are exploring, that one part is that can we conserve it? So are we using enough or are we wasting enough? That's one part of it. Two, are we efficient enough? Are we using best, best, maybe best set of technologies? Third is then looking at the alternatives, that what is the efficient use. So then we are looking at a holistic approach, not in terms of electricity, but in terms of fuel consumption. We talked about the vehicles as well. So what we are exploring, a complete strategy paper here, is that can we come out with a holistic strategic paper rather than talking about one component of the sector? That's the plan. So even for the city of Mumbai, and we have some activists from, from Mumbai here, uh, and they have something called the advanced locality management. Oh. So like what you've done uh, in the city of Kochi, in the microcosm of Mumbai, you could probably do it in specific locations and, and replicate a similar example uh, there as well. We'll, we'll explore those possibilities yes, yes, with you. Yes, yes. But anyway, thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank and, you. And we'll come back to you in case there are any more questions.
I'll, I'll request Srikant now to make a presentation about what they're doing in Panji. Good evening, everyone. Uh, let me introduce myself. I am Srikant Lavande, Assistant Engineer for Corporation of the City of Panji, Goa. Uh, CCP is thankful to Government of Maharashtra, Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai, European Union, Mumbai First, and Consul General of Kingdom of Netherlands for inviting and giving us opportunity to participate in Climate Crisis 2.0 event. So if you see this uh, city profile of the corporate city of Panji, uh, Panji Municipal Corporation, that is City Corporation of Panji, is the smallest municipal corporation in India. If you see the area of the municipal corporation, it is uh, 8.12 square kilometer with the 30 administrative wards and uh, the census population of 2011 is 40,017. And the uh, floating population, as you know, Goa being the tourist destination, the floating population is very huge during the Christmas time, New Year time. Uh, this, if you see this, uh, it's a unique and diverse ecosystem where we are on the corporate city of Panji is on the bank of uh, Mandev River. You can see the red color portion, city corporation Panji, and the urban agglomeration area, and next Zuari River and then water goes to the Arabian Sea. So there is a chances of more flooding in the corporation city of Panji area. If you see this uh, drainage network of the city of Panji, uh, there are surface drains. Second level is there are underground drains and there are still down below there are Portuguese drains, still water is flowing from those drains to the Mandavi River. If you see the city levels from 0 to 5 elevation, which most of the Panjim roads, 18 June Road, MG Road, or the DB Road of Panjim, during uh, monsoon season, maybe at uh, 1.8 uh, high tide, almost there will be definitely there will be flooding. And the uh, high altitude of 5 to 10 elevation levels are okay and safe. If you see the impact of flooding, we have got uh, socio-economic impact, infrastructure, and environmental. Uh, I will not go into detail. Slide is very much clear. So uh, further, I request my colleague, Sri Amar Kulkarni, who is working on various uh, issues pertaining to Panjim City. So I request Mr. Amar to kindly present the remaining four slides. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, myself, I'm a Kulkarni. I'm an architect and urban planner. And uh, I'll just take ahead the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Lavande. Uh, so uh, we, uh, can you go to the slide, uh, next slide, please? Uh, next slide. Yeah, so uh, we have identified uh, like couple of issues uh, regarding flooding. And uh, one of the like important issues is like uh, increased rainfall, we'll see that in the next slide, then uh, silting of natural drains over the years, uh, high tides and rainfall. So whenever high tides and rainfalls are together, like a heavy rainfall and high tide, it's definitely the city gets flooded. Uh, also, one other thing is land use changes. That also I will come later because the land use changes over the years, like sealing of you know natural like grass and soil, that has basically increased the runoff rate. Also, flooding has increased due to that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, these are this slide you can see the uh, indicators: rainfall and high tide characteristics. So rainfall, you can actually see the uh, Goa received 122% above average rains last year. And here also you can see uh, behind me, 67% increase has been there from 1901 to 2015. Like in a, like it's a gra gradual increase, but it's uh, slowly going on. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, this slide is there which actually says uh, there is a gradual uh, decline in rainfall, like uh, normal rainfall days, and there is an uh, increase in very heavy and uh, basically extreme heavy rainfall. So we can see here from 1980 to 2020, 
that the number of days with extreme precipitation, they are increasing slowly. And this is one of the challenges when it comes to the city because as uh, Mr. Lavande said that it's an Ishuran ecosystem with two rivers on one side and Arabian Sea on the uh, other side. Uh, there is a high chances of high tide. And with high tides and uh, heavy rainfall, uh, our uh, basically natural drains are also getting choked with a lot of silt and solid waste. So this becomes a, a huge problem. Next slide, please. Uh, so yeah, so there you can just see this is a simple slide for people to understand. So you can see here from 2003 and 2022, it's not a lot of years, but you can see the amount of uh, basically uh, built up area which has increased and green area which has decreased and a lot of uh, uh, basically Panjim has been like Panjim has a lot of uh, basically marshy lands, wetlands, lakes and a uh, lot of green spaces there but it's slowly decreasing and a lot of built environment is coming so this is directly basing, uh, uh, this is affecting the flooding. Next slide please. Uh, so we are working on basically, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, like stormwater management plan for Panjim, where we, this is under process. So we are trying, we like main issue and then we are trying to see what are the effects and causes. Also we have uh, tried to identify the study areas and uh, we have developed uh, what kind of data collection is required to create an integrated analysis. So this is still uh, going on. This is one of the pages, uh, which is from the uh, this plan. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, yeah. So uh, 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 international urban uh, regional cooperation under uh, EU funded project. They have uh, created sustainable energy and climate action plan for Panjim in 2019. And uh, we can see here uh, from their studies that in, by 2030, the total uh, estimated emissions from 2019 will increase by 36%. That's quite a, a substantial number. And uh, the more share we can see is from electricity and transport. So we've been basically consist consistently working with the state department to address these challenges. So they have basically uh, suggested some key actions and we have been taking uh, be, uh, some actions on uh, their suggestion. So we, they have uh, suggested to replace uh, solid waste management vehicles with electric vehicles, the current vehicles, which are diesel and uh, petrol based. So we have been partially converting the, those to CNG and electric. Uh, also set up of biomethanation plants that is also under process. Four of them have been already installed in the city. Uh, strengthen the public transport. So public transportation from Goa is not really great. The modal share is only 2%. So we have, uh, like with the state department, we are introducing 48 electric buses in the city. Uh, this will also not just serve Panjim, but also urban agglomeration of Panjim. Uh, introduction of EV vehicles with charging stations. So with uh, Ekle South Asia, we are introducing normal uh, electric vehicles as well as we are introducing freight electric vehicles which is being largely neglected with uh, installation of electric stations. And uh, implementation of non-motorized vehicle zone. So we have already council, the city council has approved uh, two uh, basically non-motorized zones in the city and uh, currently they are under like uh, we are implementing them. Next slide please. Uh, yeah, so City of Panjim has uh, collaborated with City of Almada uh, with support from IURC uh, under uh, EU funded project. So uh, in that, uh, the City of Almada has been already working on uh, urban flood management and their geography is quite similar to, uh, we can say that the Panjim, they are also kind of an estuarine ecosystem with facing similar type of problems. So, uh, we will be getting technical support and help from uh, City of Almada to work towards uh, better flood management in Panjim. Next slide, please. Uh, this project is currently underway, which is uh, one of the creeks in Panjim, uh, which is uh, famous, it's Sentinel's Creek, but it has been basically getting polluted with a lot of solid waste over the years. Now uh, the project has started where we are desilting the creek and this creek is one of the important shock absorbers for urban flooding. This basically project will take uh, this, the, by the next year this project should get completed and this will be very helpful in managing the urban flooding. Next slide please. And uh, one other uh, basically project under pa Project Urban Leaving Lab, uh, nature based solutions like uh, 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 solu nature based solutions will be implemented in the city. So. 
the uh, map has been already drawn uh, like we have already mapped uh, what are the nature based uh, basically uh, the ecosystems are there different ecosystems kazan field mangroves uh, salt pans and other ecosystems and then we we have also like this is a short slide but we have also identified steps how we can implement those nature based solutions like for example how we can use bioremediation to treat the water and infiltrate the water so similarly how we can use the ecosystem services itself for better flood management next slide please uh, but this is one of the mitigation actions which has been uh, taken by the state department and this also we uh, the ccp has a role to play in this so under national cyclone risk uh, mitigation project we have built a shelter home uh, which is in panjim city and the total accommodation capacity of it is 550 people uh, similarly, there is a uh, basically to disseminate information uh, about cyclones and tsunamis under uh, this early warning dissemination system, uh, there will be three towers erected to warn people about uh, cyclones and tsunamis. Next slide, please. And uh, these are some, some of the important studies and projects focusing on climate change uh, in collaboration with the Corporation of City of Panjim. So one is Sustainable Energy and Climate Action Plan, which IURC has developed in collaboration with the city. Uh, others is the flood management and water ma uh, body management projects are underway with Smart City and uh, Danish Embassy. So they have been working with the city on these projects. One of the projects uh, Eclipse South Asia is working with the corporation is Ecologistics, where we are trying to address the emissions related to the logistics in the city and uh, urban vulnerability assessment and low uh, emission strategy for Panjim has already been developed and we're trying to see that uh, if we can uh, basically implement the solutions given in the reports. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. That was a very good presentation. Thank you, Mr. Kurni. Thank you, Mr. Laundi. Thank you. Uh, we also have, um, uh, and I, I hope I get the name right, Koyan Jebrad. Uh, from the uh, Department of Water, Water Synergy, Water Strategy and Development, Municipality of Rotterdam. Uh, is he here? Is, is he going to be on the, on the, on the BC? Yeah. So can we connect him? Yeah. Okay. Yes, hi. Uh, so welcome to this conference. Uh, over to you now. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Good. Thank you uh, for uh, inviting uh, Rotterdam to this conference. Uh, we're very pleased. Um, and uh, my name is Corian Gebraat. I'm an uh, advisor at uh, the Urban Management Department, uh, working on water and climate adaptation in the city. And um, I hope to give you some inspiration from Europe, from Rotterdam, about uh, adaptation in a city and especially uh, in Rotterdam. Um, I give you just some insights in how we approach uh, this uh, climate uh, change issue um, with a focus on, on flood uh, management. Just uh, some, uh, some information about uh, the Netherlands. Uh, uh, in fact, it's one, one great delta with uh, several uh, rivers um, uh, coming uh, uh, to the Netherlands. And uh, as you uh, uh, know, a lot of the area, uh, more than a quarter of the Netherlands is below sea level, and that's also the case in, uh, in Rotterdam. When you see this, uh, this, this hate map, you can see the brownish area is, is, is uh, right uh, above sea level. That's about uh, from, from uh, two and a half to, uh, uh, to four meters above uh, sea level. But the blue area is below sea level and a lot of the area where people live is uh, below sea level. So there are different areas with, which uh, ask for different uh, measures. Um, because we have a lot of uh, area that is below sea level, we have, in fact, to pump all the water, all the rainwater out of the area. So we have a lot of pumping stations in the city uh, which pump water into canals and then uh, finally into the river. Um, so this is a, 
really big task of uh, our uh, department to, uh, to drain, in fact, our uh, city. Protection against sea level rise and also against uh, high waters is uh, in Rotterdam also done by this uh, large storm surge barrier, the Maasland clearing. In fact, this is one of the last um, works of the Delta Works uh, uh, built in 1997, uh, which can uh, yeah, prevent uh, storm surges to come into the city and in, into the hinterland. And that's because yeah, the Delta Works were start because of the big flooding in 1953, when a lot of the area was, uh, was, was flooded and, and dikes were broken. Uh, here you can see a little bit uh, the, the extensive uh, the extensive network of dikes in, in the city. The red ones are the, the primary dikes and secondary are, are smaller dikes, but they are all maintained because this is, yeah, it's very important for us to live in this, uh, in this area, in this city. And as you can see in the pictures, a lot of these dikes are incorporated in the fabric, uh, the, the structure of the city. So it's also a challenge when you have, uh, uh, you, you have to renew or heighten them. And still we have uh, a lot of uh, area which is outside uh, the dikes, uh, and that is flooded regularly now, nowadays already, but you can imagine that in future with climate change, this is a, a, a big challenge for us, and also the, the whole uh, area of the, the, the port of Rotterdam, um, which is uh, almost 100% outside the protection of dikes, uh, there is a risk of flooding, so the, the port authority is very uh, aimed at um, protecting that uh, now and also for the future. But not only the sea and the rivers are important, of course, we also have a lot of uh, rainfall. Um, it, these are uh, really other uh, figures than I saw net uh, about uh, Goa. <laughs> Uh, in, on average in Rotterdam, it's uh, only 900 uh, millimeters a year, uh, but still uh, it, it is increasing and uh, between 1910 and 2017 is more than 27% increasement. So we have to deal with that because, uh, as I said, a lot of the area is below sea level, so the pumping capacity has to be raised also. And one of the issues that uh, we are dealing now with is that we had uh, more water in the city uh, in the past, uh, but we decided to make roads of it, uh, so that is now causing uh, new uh, problems, so we have to think about how to create more water in the city. So what kind of decisions do we make today? That's the question. We started uh, already in 2008 developing a first climate adaptation strategy, which was finished in 2013, which focused really on uh, the robust system, but also on the, uh, the, the, the public space area. So we said we, we need more um, uh, options, so we need more using the space in the city as well public as well as, as, as uh, private space. And this, so we have to cooperate a lot with our citizens, with people who own uh, uh, properties or own um, buildings. That's uh, important to start with. So from then on, we, we uh, developed this uh, strategy. And in 2018, we started a new uh, uh, plan, we developed a framework which is finished uh, in a few months, um, which is focusing on uh, six uh, themes, six challenges, uh, flooding, rainfall, heat, uh, groundwater, land subsidence and droughts. Um, and we uh, did a lot of assessments for the city and now are building a plan uh, what kind of measures we can take in different areas because uh, because the city has different characters, different areas, we have to take different 
sort of measures. Um, and then I want to tell you a little bit about the, the approaches we use in this, um, in the water management, but also in uh, uh, climate adaptation, is that uh, the first is the sort of three safety layers approach that it's used in, in flood management, uh, which in fact says that there are three layers. One, the first one is prevention to, in fact, um, preventing that flooding occurs, think about dikes. Second is a sort of um, measures that we can do via spatial planning and design and construction. It, it's in fact focused on the controlled handling of water, it's more a spatial uh, uh, measures. And finally, we have, of course, crisis management that we also have to prepare when there is a really uncontrolled flooding, which is always possible. Um, and this living with water ID is uh, fairly connected with uh, the spatial measures. Uh, and a good example of this on a national scale is the national program Room for the River that has uh, run and has resulted in a lot of uh, large projects in the rivers, along the rivers to, to get more space, to use more space, but also use uh, this uh, space in a, in a, in a good man manner um, and, and, and give it a really uh, quality to live and to work. And sometimes it is flooded, but uh, it can handle that. And on a local level, we do this also in the city. We try to uh, delay the water drainage and store it in the city to use it for, for instance, in uh, dry periods, but also uh, to drain it to the, to the underground, um, uh, uh, to evaporate more, add green to it, so uh, there is uh, also cooling of the city in hot uh, uh, times, and then drain, of course, drainage keeps important, but we have, in fact, a sort of change in approach uh, the last decades. And I think it's important, and I have uh, a lot of uh, examples of that. First is this one, in fact, an old rail railway track we are reused that is changed in a, in a park, and we use this water into uh, the streets below uh, to drain it in, in, into the ground. Uh, and this project is, is just now in a development phase. But we have all kinds of um, uh, uh, storage in all kinds of sorts, uh, in canals, in the city, in an underground storage, but also uh, storage under uh, uh, um, highway junctions. And of course, I didn't see this picture, but there is another picture, oh, the water plazas, which is in fact an idea about using uh, your public space in a multifunctional way. So 95% of the time, this uh, plaza is just used as a plaza, as a playing ground, but you can also yeah, store ahead. water can I, can in I just, it. Uh, can I just, <laughs> sorry, yeah. can, I, can I just intervene? Uh, because we are, we are probably going to be running out of time. So if you can just wind up in the next uh, one minute or so, that would be great. Can we just okay. finish in the I'll next do. one minute because we are running out of time? I understand. Um, just some pictures, just some examples of how we store, uh, add water storage in the city and also add more greening in the city with a rooftop uh, landscape program. And we, in fact, we are greening on all kinds of levels to uh, store water, but also to cool down the city. And also along the river, we try to uh, extend the nature-based solutions by restoring green riverbanks using uh, parts that are already green, but extending this. And I think this is uh, one of the measures uh, which also gives quality to the city. And we, for every type of landscape, we have our, our own type of, of, of riverbank. Just one, this is my uh, uh, last slide, just to give an insight of how we are financing that. This is the, the, uh, the municipal budget, and a lot of the uh, investments come from municipal budgets, but we also have additional co-funding from EU, national, regional, and local authorities. But uh, you can understand a lot of the 
water related taxes also are used for climate adaptation because it's really related to water management in the city. Thank you very much and uh, I hope uh, it gives you a little bit insight in how we uh, do this in, uh, in Rotterdam. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. This was uh, really very insightful and thanks for, uh, for a very extensive uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, description about what you're trying to do here in your, in your city. Uh, I'm going to actually request uh, some of my colleagues in Mumbai first that, you know, this uh, city of Rotterdam has come up twice, in fact, uh, once in the morning and once just now. I think they have a pretty elaborate system of, uh, you know, how to handle floods particularly. Uh, it might be a good idea for us to collaborate with them and do a workshop here in the city of Mumbai where they can showcase what they're doing because to my mind, I think um, this half an hour presentation is not really doing justice to the kind of work that they have done. So we should probably have a separate workshop for them as well. So, so thanks a lot, Koyan, for, uh, for, for joining us. I'm going to just go, go straight to, um, uh, to um, Chua um, Dennis, the head of... Uh, the head Urban of uh, Transition Office uh, in Portugal. So um, I think we have a message from them. Uh, I'm going to request uh, to keep the message short because we're kind of running out of time. Uh, over to you, Joan. Good morning. My name is Joan Diniz. I'm responsible for the climate action strategies for the city of Cascais in Portugal, and I'll be sharing a bit of what is our climate change adaptation strategies. You just share my screen with you all and uh, now share the presentation. So welcome to Cascais. Cascais is a beautiful town uh, located in the outskirts of the Lisbon metropolitan region, stuck between uh, the ocean and a mountain range. So in those 100 square kilometers, we have approximately one third, which is protecting landscape. And uh, this natural heritage became a very important ask for us, which is very relevant to, for preservation, of course. And this is because we've already seen visible impacts of climate change scenarios that are already occurring. These climate change scenarios were studied since uh, 2009 on our first, first strategic uh, planning assessment, uh, where we had the definition of different scenarios and what's the likelihood of uh, a given uh, regional uh, scenario happening here. Uh, later on, we did what is the first Portuguese local climate change uh, adaptation action plan. And on this, we had uh, the framework of the IPCC methodologies. Again, we had the, uh, the methodology framework of the SDGs 2030. And of course, this was approved in the town hall meeting, which made it mandatory for implementation. Of course, the scenarios maintain the same principles. We see just the likelihood of the most severe scenarios happening uh, with this study. And we defined together with a wide set of professionals from different sectors here, from Qashqai and partner stakeholders, um, the actions that we should consider. So these are 13 measures divided into 82 different actions. And we learned very interestingly that the most impactful actions are considered non-structural or green solutions. That means that we need to qualify our staff it means that we should increase awareness for local citizens and local communities, but also to invest in green solutions, greening our cities, uh, making sure that the natural habitats are uh, even better than before. When it comes to action, we divided this into uh, five operational sectors. So we're working with different teams to make sure that this works well. Uh, just to give, to give you a few examples on the sector of awareness and education, we have invested heavily in uh, making sure that we have a school program where children from all ages can learn a bit more about climate change and what they can do so they can help us to inform their families as well. We've included um, art exhibitions and uh, photographic exhibits as well. We've, uh, we've been trying to create a program of qualification training for our staff, but also for stakeholders as well. So this goes on yearly and every year we, we repeat the same, the same um, uh, initiatives to make sure that even a greater number of professionals is duly qualified to tackle the challenges of climate change. Uh, we've also been heavily invested in a very successful fund, the Climate uh, Adapt Fund, that's the Qashqai's Adapt Fund, 
So this is very relevant because, because we give a given set of money uh, for institutions, namely NGOs here in Kishkaj, where they can implement climate resilience actions for themselves with our, uh, with our visibility as well together. Uh, then we have water resources uh, operational group. This is very relevant because Kashkaish doesn't have uh, water and, and its own sources. Actually, you only have one source, which uh, gives us about 10 to 15 percent of our needs, which is this uh, river dam that you see here. All other wa all water comes from other cities and from other areas and other sources. So we need to make sure that we save a lot of water, that we make the distribution as efficient as, as we can. Uh, this goes on with multiple activities as well, one of which is recycling water, recycled water uh, in our, what we call a non-noble use, for example, urban cleaning. Then we have civil protection and health operational group, where we've, uh, for example, installed meteorological stations to provide uh, real-time data, which is very important, for example, in this case that you see here, where we gave to the fire department uh, data while they were fighting a fire back in 2018 and the wind direction was changing and they were able to fight the fire knowing exactly how the wind was behaving. Uh, this is just uh, one example. We are also doing um, uh, communication campaigns whenever there's a heat wave or very hot days coming up uh, to inform people to stay at home and, and during the afternoon drink water, don't drink sugary drinks, if you want to go to the beach, make sure that you go early in the morning or later in the afternoon. Uh, be careful with UV radiation and so on. Then we have the ecological infrastructure group. Basically, what we're doing is retrofitting our urban green space to make sure that we design them according to the climate that we have. So this means, for example, that we reduce the, 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 the watering areas. Uh, so instead of watering some of the plants, we just choose native plants where they don't need this. It's just uh, the water from the winter time and the humidity of the air is enough for them. This is obviously quite significant change in the way that we plan and the way we design, but also the way we engage with citizens because there's no more lawns or there's less lawns available. And uh, instead of uh, having very colorful plants, we have local autochthonous plants or fruit trees as well. So this saves not only a lot of water, but it keeps the function of an urban green space. And another thing that we're doing is, for example, the, uh, the greenway restorations of green uh, river beds. This is also very important because they help with the acclimatization of the sea of the urban areas. That means that they would help to regulate the temperature with cooler air. Uh, all this information was uh, designed and shared with all other municipalities that we, we know. This is very important for us to share, to learn from others as well. Uh, and so that's why we did a lot of manuals, we did organize a lot of workshops, so we could all share these. Things. This is uh, one example of one of those riverbeds that we qualified, uh, where we had a very severe uh, precipitation event, uh, 100 millimeters uh, in less than 12 hours, which is a lot for us, according to our climate, and it's more or less one-sixth of the yearly precipitation level. So <clears throat> in less than 12 hours, it's just one day. So obviously, we had a flood, the flood lasted for a couple of hours there. It was a, fla a flash flood, but luckily there was absolutely no damage that we have to report. There was no damage in the riverbed. There was no damage uh, in infrastructure, except in a couple of restaurants that are still located in the flooding area downtown, which is a medieval designed area. And we cannot change that. So anyway, it was a significant leap. And uh, then we further this information with information on real life uh, data for flooding. This way, those people that are downtown, they can get even more information and you know just take their belongings out before something happens. And finally, all this information is, uh, is passed on into regulation. So both spatial planning and regulation for housing. We need to make sure that we take care of our territory with efficiency and also with uh, respect for the future climate. Uh, this plan of ours is well over 60% uh, uh, of implementation already in 2020. We're now doing the assessment for 2021. Due to the pandemic, we had some delays on this uh, uh, process. But our key findings are mostly that team coordination and knowledge level are the main challenges that we face. That's why we invest so much in knowledge and in, in qualification and in awareness. 
um, most of the, the, the actions that tackle these vulnerabilities are nature-based solution. And of course, uh, all the regulations that we do must include the principles of resilience, of adaptation, and uh, the, the greening of the city, of course. So this is this is a transformative spirit for us, and we all. So uh, I do appreciate uh, your 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 time, and let us know, share with us if you have any questions for the future. Thank you very much, and uh, bye, bye. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Johan. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, okay, uh, I know that some of you probably might be having this overpowering urge to ask questions. Unfortunately, I might not be able to give you time to ask those because we are run out of time. So uh, uh, I'm going to stop here. Uh, going to ask uh, maybe the uh, the the conductor of the uh, of the session today to take over and take take us uh, through the the last session of the day. Thank you. And thanks a lot. Thank you very much for, for being here, and thanks for a very interesting presentation.